head of the blue collar over there. All right. Praise the Lord. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is Pastor V.C. Elliott from the Body of Christ Christian Ministries on our Thursday night Bible study. Um, as always, we come together to encourage, uplift, and support one another. And the goal behind this is to enlighten and to share the word in a way that will make uh, to help you grow in your faith and grow in your <clears throat> relationship with God. So before I get started tonight, I'm just going to pray. And uh, this is the first time I'm broadcasting live. So um, this is something that we're going to be doing every week where you can actually um, go to the page and you can actually click the link to join as I'm actually teaching the message. So uh, like I said, I'm going to pray and then we're going to get into the topic for tonight. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you and praise you. We praise you for all that you've done and all that you continue to do in our lives. We thank you for being our source, our teacher, and our guide. We thank you for uh, your presence in our life as our father, as our protector, as our healer, as our leader. We thank you for Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, which puts us in a position to be in right standing with you and for you to hear us as we pray. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit, which is our teacher and our guide, which is ever with us all the time, guiding us along the way, speaking and dealing with our spirits so that we can ultimately live our lives um, to your glory. And so we just thank you and praise you. I ask that as we get started tonight, that I decrease in my thought and my mind and you increase, that when we speak about this topic tonight, that your ideas and your thoughts move forward so that people's lives can be changed for the better. And I yield myself to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So tonight is going to be a little bit different. Uh, not so much different, but a little different in that I'm not going to quote a whole lot of scriptures to you. Uh, I don't know what scriptures I'm going to quote to you because really what's on my heart is at the heart of, of what this uh, Thursday night Bible study is all about. And it is uh, helping you to develop a stronger relationship through Christ. And so how do we do that? Um, one of the main principles that I learned that changed my life for the better is to study to show yourself approved. So it's studying the word of God um, and building your relationship with him bit by bit that causes your life to change for the better as you re realize and, and as the word is revealed to you in a way that impacts your life for the better. You grow and you develop in your relationship so that uh, you're able to, to operate on a level that's different and better uh, than anybody else uh, that that don't have ha him in, in your life. So uh, tonight we're just going to talk about how do you study, you know, because it's easy to say that as a Christian, you're supposed to develop your relationship and you're supposed to study. But if you don't know how to study, then that's a problem. And if you listen to me uh, week after week or you go back and listen to the messages that I teach, you shouldn't just take my the, the things that I say to you as face value. You, you have to go back and you have to look at what I've presented to you and then go back in the word and validate what I'm telling you so that you know that I'm on target, line upon line and precept upon precept, um, giving you exactly what the word says and I'm not adding anything to it or taking anything away. Um, that's how you protect yourself and, and, and not get led astray in error. So today, uh, the reason why I'm talking about this, the purpose for this is to help us as believers, myself included, to become aware of, one, how we're working to develop a real relationship with God. That That's really the key. How am I working to develop my relationship with God? Uh, reading the word is good. Studying the word is what we need to do. Um, and then my goal is from an awareness standpoint to encourage you to read and study the word as a means of developing your faith. So that's what this is all about. And so um, tonight I'm going to ask a couple of questions and I'll give you some thoughts on the topic. And, and this is designed once again to inspire you to want to dig into the word more because there's a lot of preachers out there and they're preaching. I would say the majority of what they're preaching is probably based on the word, but 
if you don't understand that there's context to everything in the Bible, and the Bible is made up of books, the books of the Bible are designed to tell a story. And the story that it's telling is a history of the children of Israel, the history of the, the origin of the world, and then the children of Israel, and then the story of Christ, and then the life of the disciples ministering the word afterwards, and then the revelation. It's a history book that has built-in principles that are designed to show you the voice of God, the spirit of God, and what he's trying to teach us to give us guidelines to live our lives effectively to discover our purpose, to understand our value, to understand who we are so that we can bring family and community back together here on earth. And so that our uh, eternal destination is with him. So because of that, because of how the book is designed and what all the book contains. A lot of times people make grand statements that are often taken out of context. Like the Bible is the express word of God. That is absolutely true. But everything in the Bible is not a specific word that was being spoken to us. Some of what's in the Bible is context for the principles that God wants to share. And if you can't tell the difference between the principle and context, if you can't tell the difference when a person is speaking and when God is speaking, sometimes you might hear something that Paul says. And what Paul says is what's on Paul's heart. You have to determine whether he's speaking for himself or is he speaking out of the revelation of Christ? If Peter says something, is Peter speaking about his experience in walking with Christ and his observations? Or is he declaring a principle that God shared with him for the betterment of our life? There's a differentiation with what's being spoken about. The book of Numbers, is it just list, listing the lineage and the heritage of people or is it trying to establish biblical principle? The book of Chronicles. Why does it list all of these names? Why do we have to go through all of these names and all of these generations? What is that for? Is that the word? Am I supposed to preach that, you know, uh, there was Abraham and then Abraham begot. Is that the scripture that I'm supposed to speak? Well, it's in the Bible. It's the word. It's written. But what is it for? What was that part of the Bible meant to do? It was meant to give us an understanding of the line of generations that lead down to Christ and so when you understand, it gives us a historical perspective on when things happen. You'll notice that some things that were happening in the book of Kings might have been happening at the same time something else was happening in another book of the Bible. And it allows you to put those things together to give you a context of what's going on during that time and the struggles that might have been going on in two different places. The Bible is not a chronological book. It does start in Genesis, which is the beginning, but everything that comes after that is not in chronological order. So some things that are spoken, like I said, in Kings might be happening at the same time or around the same time as what's happening in Exodus. And without that context, then you might be saying first came this and then came that, and it might be happening at the same time. 
you might hear a name in one book and then hear it in another book and not understand they're talking about the same person. That takes study. That takes context. Without studying the word, without reading the word first to get a general understanding and then studying the word and breaking down the context, here's my here's my notion. When you tell a story, you just don't make the point and end the story there. When you tell a story, there's a beginning. There's like information to set the stage as to what's going on and what's the circumstances and situations. And then there is a situation, the storyline, the, the main thing that we're going to follow. So you have context and then you have this main thing that we're going to follow. And as this thing is transpiring, it's telling you all of the things that are related to it as it follows through its path to completion. Because without context, what you're saying doesn't really have any meaning. The Bible is the same way. It's a book. It's a history. But the principles in the Bible have to have context. And so some of the things in the Bible are not scripture from the standpoint of doctrine. But they're scripture in the context of giving context to the principle. And so you have to understand who is speaking and for whom they are speaking to really understand that. Now, that's a lot of background to why I'm actually talking about this today. But my hope is that even by saying just those few things, it brings an awareness to you of really the context of the book. Because people who are new in Christ, people who study the word and want to speak against the word of God, will start to pick things out of the word to try to create the idea in your mind that, it's flawed or it was man-made or um, it contradicts itself or different notions like that. It's not an accurate book. If you don't know how to study the word and understand context and understand what's going on, someone who knows a little bit more about the word than you can lead you astray. They can sell you a notion based on a few facts and because you have no means to go and study it to really define it for yourself, you're not empowered to stand and refute what you say you believe. One of the greatest things that I've learned throughout my lifetime and my journey with Christ is that a pastor can teach the word. And help you, help guide you to the point where you understand that Jesus Christ is Lord and that you make that confession. They can continue to teach you and help you develop by teaching you principles of the word of God to help you grow your relationship. But at some point, everything that the pastor is teaching you is supposed to draw you to a closer relationship in a personal relationship with Christ yourself. How does that happen if all we do is listen to them and everything that they say is what we go by? I often say, I think that there is a kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade in <laughs> ministry. And when you don't know anything, learning something is better than nothing. So you may start out in the ministry where they expose you to and bring you to the point of making your confession and start to expose you to the principles of the word and teach you, teach you some fundamentals like how to pray. But if they're not driving you to read and study the word for themselves, if all you're doing is going to sit in a pew every Sunday and they're not encouraging you to read the word, they're not um, challenging you to to learn and apply what it is that you learn and understand. And if you don't have a means to ask questions and um, to, to get your, get clarity on the things that are being taught, then that might be kindergarten for you and you may need to move to first grade. In second grade and third grade. 
Our whole education system is designed to teach us the fundamental principles. How to, what are letters? What sounds do they make? How do those combinations of letters form words? Then what do the words mean? How to use them in a sentence? How to construct sentences so we can speak and communicate effectively? Then how to express our ideas? How to understand and comprehend complex, uh, complex stories? How to understand literature and art and poetry and and music in, in, in the context of what they bring to the table. You know, how, how, what is an essay? What is a story? Um, what is a, uh, a research paper? What is, um, what is a blog? What, what are the forms of communication that are out there? Education is designed to teach us all of these forms of education for the purpose of being able to decipher what we're reading when we read it and say, oh, this is an opinion paper. This isn't a fact paper. This is an opinion paper. An opinion paper is different from a fact paper. A fact paper is going to list specific things that you can go back and study and research, and it's going to cite its sources. An opinion paper may also cite sources, but it's going to be opinion specifically and not factual things that you can necessarily validate. All of these things are important, even in the context of studying the word of God. Because without it, guess what? Without being able to recognize the difference between a fact and an opinion, without being able to understand what a story is and what a poem is, when you're reading the Bible, you'll be absolutely lost. Without being able to understand and comprehend what words are or be able to pick up a dictionary or a vines or a concordance and go in and look at the origin of the word and what it came from, what the root of the word is to see what that word really means. And without being able to understand context, you might not be able to even decipher what it is that you're reading or what it truly means. That's why it's important to understand how you study. Do you study? Is a real question. One of my favorite scriptures. A scripture that uh, kind of put things into perspective for me. It was Hebrews 13 and 5, I believe. And I'm going to read it to you. And tell you why it impacted my life the way that it did. So Hebrews 13 and 5 says, and this is the King James Version. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. If I read it in the New Living Translation, it'll maybe make it a little bit clearer to you. It says, keep on loving each other. As No, that's not it. I'm sorry. It says, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Now, wait a minute. The King James Version said a whole bunch of other words that it, that didn't sound like exactly what it said. It said, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. This says, don't love money. So one says don't love money, but the other one references conversation. How does that relate? Well, when you study the King James version of the scripture and you break it down, it says, let your conversation, conversation deals with your moral character and your witness. 
So this is saying let your let your moral character and what people see of you be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Well, if if my character and my disposition is supposed to be without covetousness, what is covetousness? Let me get to let me get to that. I'm gonna go to. Yeah, by the way, if you guys don't have a lot of Bible resources, one of the best Bible resources that I've been able to find is a program called BlueLetterBible.com. BlueLetterBible.com for anybody who is able and who has a desire to kind of learn more about um what how to break down the scripture that is a great resource so once again based on the King James version it says let your conversation be without covetousness and when I look at the context of that covetousness or the phrase without covetousness really means well, hold on. I'm actually looking at the program now because I want to make sure that I say it correctly. I don't want to misquote the meaning of the word. So be without covetousness is the point that's Greek Eight six Greek eight sixty six or G eight sixty six is what it is, and covetousness. Oh, I changed it. I'm going back. That's what I get. I've studied this scripture so many times. I don't often go back to study it, but I'm going to look at it this way. All right. Covetousness. It means a strong desire after the possession of worldly things. A strong desire after the possession of worldly things. So when he says, let your moral character or your disposition be without the desire of possessions uh, or not be after a strong desire uh, of worldly possessions. And then it says, but be content or be satisfied with such things as you have. When you read the, the New King, uh, the New Living Translation, it says, don't love money. Basically, out of those two scriptures, I get the context that is saying don't desire or seek after the love of money or the love of things or worldly possessions, but be satisfied with where you are in God because God says he'll never leave you or forsake you. In this case, conversation doesn't mean what I think it means. Conversation means moral character, disposition, or your witness. When I first read it, I thought it meant how I talk to people. So if I read the scripture thinking that conversation meant two-way communication with people or communication between one person and others, then I would have understood the scripture, and I did, to mean don't let what you say about other people or what you communicate to people demonstrate that you have a love of money or what other people possess, but be content with what you have. And that's not what it's saying. It's saying don't let your moral character or your disposition or your witness or your actions be desiring of what other people have. There's a difference between what you say and what you what your motivation in your heart is. The scripture is dealing with the motivation of your heart to seek after what other people have. What I understood it to be is just don't don't talk about, you know, wanting to be like somebody else. So don't talk about that's not what it means. 
But without rightly dividing the word of truth, I would have I misunderstood that scripture, misquoted the meaning of that scripture and had a false understanding of what that scripture meant. It was only after God taught me how to study the word. After he gave me um, a method to go in and to read a scripture and highlight the key words that I thought influenced the main meaning of the scripture that I was able to go in and define those words in the terms that they originally meant, not how I currently understand language. And by doing so, it gave me a revelation about this scripture, but it's like taking a glass of water and putting a drop of red dye. When you put the drop of red dye in there, the whole glass of water turns red. That's what happened to me. Once I understood that a scripture that I thought I clearly understood, I did not understand. It was like dropping a drip of red in my water, in my water. And now I looked at the whole Bible as something that I could easily in something that I read and I understood in my own understanding, totally misunderstood what God was trying to say. And it made me, it, it grew in me a desire to, to study the word on a whole nother level. And then every time I heard someone preach, if I did not necessarily get, understand, or believe what was said because of something else that I've learned, if I, if I felt there was a contradiction, it gave me a desire to go study the word for myself. And that study of the word myself is what brought me to where I am today. That's what I hope I'm doing for you. I, I hope I'm inspiring you to not just read scriptures like the Psalms and take everything at face value based on what you understand the way we use language today. Because even in that, there's error. Because what they said uh, or how they said things in the past and how they use language in the past is not necessarily how we use language today. One of my funniest examples is when I was younger and, and my friends used to say, man, that was fat. And we used to joke around and say, oh, what you, you mean that was bloated? That was big? No, man, that was cool. That was fat. Well, how does fat and cool mean the same thing? It's just because that's how we adopted the language at the time. We chose to use that word and we assigned our own meaning to it. So the original meaning of the word did not correspond with how we were using the language. Then we got fancy and we wanted to spell it P-H-A-T instead of F-A-T so that we could justify and give that a meaning over something else. But at face value in reading something, a word like communication which we talk about in terms of dis distributing information to a person or a group. When I read that word in the Bible, it may not mean that. It is a form of communication. It does line up with the word in principle. Why? Because Jesus was our example. His conversation was his lifestyle and his moral character that he displayed. His example of how to live this life as a flesh and blood person and deal with the issues that the world brought and how he went back to the word and he quoted the word. That was his conversation to us. His example was his conversation. That is what we have to use for our own lives. So in this case, when he said, when we say conversation, in essence, we're only talking about the verbal conversation that doesn't have any meaning because it doesn't have any action to follow it. But in the Bible, the conversation has to have corresponding action to follow. Based on that premise, I would understand how faith comes into play. Because if your character or if your conversation is your character, your moral disposition that other people see, if that's your conversation 
Your conversation should be your faith. Your faith is the demonstration of what you believe and what we should believe is the word of God. Hopefully you see how this connects the dots. So in that scripture, the conversation that he talked about in Hebrews, which is also the primary, well, yeah, the, the primary chapter that talks about faith. Conversation in that context was talking about how we live. And when we reference how God lives, and we see through the scriptures what he dealt with, Through the word, and here's a word play too. What is Jesus Christ? He was the living word. What do we use to communicate in this day and age? Our words. He was the living word, the living example, and what is used to communicate to us how we should live today. It is our conversation. It is his conversation that is our conversation. And our conversation is more than just what we say. It's really what's in our heart and what causes us to act. So with that, the revelation of that word, you can see how that would change your whole life and perspective. Just in studying one scripture, and because of that, it lit a fire in me. That fire is what I continue to push on now. So I felt compelled to share with you the importance of studying the word to show yourself approved for yourselves. None of us are perfect. All of us can err. Even in our righteous way of thinking, there are so many biblical phrases that we've heard that's been taught out of context. There are so many things that have just been preached and preached and preached and accepted because the source of the person who said it is highly respected or believed to be true. Or we perceive that they have fruit in their life, which allows us to, to rest in what they say with confidence. But in that, that's dangerous. We still have to go back and we still have to study it because before we make it a principle by which we live and before we make it a principle by which we share with other people to impact their lives, we need to validate the validity of it to make sure that what we're saying is true to the best of our ability. Even more so, as individual Christians, we have to be willing to say when we have made a mistake, if we've erred, if we got it wrong. Because I was sharing my revelation, my false revelation of Hebrews 13 and 5 with everybody because I felt like it was telling me not to try to be like other people. And they agreed because what I said made sense. I was a trusted source. This was early in my Christian career before I ever knew I was called to teach. I was just sharing the word. And I was sharing it wrong. Then when I truly studied, I learned to be quiet and only share what I've studied out and what God confirmed to me and not every single thing that I heard. Even when I sit in the church, I listen to what the pastor has to say and I take notes so that I can go back and study it for myself. Because before I speak something out of my mouth that can affect and change people's lives one way or another, I want to make sure to the best of my ability is accurate. I've been caught up in the spirit of church and people have been saying stuff. And you know what? The other thing that we have to be concerned with when we're preachers or pastors or teachers is that we don't get caught up in the spirit and we don't get to adding things at the end. We need to know when to stop. And the word could be good all the way up to a point. And then we get happy and start just saying stuff because now we're no longer in the spirit. 
the spirit is still there, but now we're 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 just saying stuff that we believe because we we trying to keep that thing going. We have to be careful and mindful. But as individuals, we have to know how to rightly divide the word of truth. Like I said from the beginning, the purpose of me sharing this with you today, this is not based on religion. This is not based on uh, how well I can teach or anything like that. This is to help us as believers become aware of how we are working to develop our real relationship with God. But our relationship with God is developed through the time that we spend reading his word and studying his word for understanding and praying to him for clarification. Once again, my goal from this, from an awareness standpoint, is to encourage you to read the word and study it as a means to developing your faith. My admonishment to you is not to take everything that a, 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 a great speaker has to say to heart. Study it out for yourself. And if you don't know how to study, continue to come by. We're going to have some open forums where you'll be able to talk. They won't be recorded. But it'll be an opportunity to talk about the word and for you to ask questions in the midst of the teaching to get a greater understanding. I think that is the best forum to allow us to grow. That way, if you have an understanding and I have an understanding, we can take both of those understandings to the word so that it can clarify itself. With that being said, I just thank you and appreciate you coming in today, listening to this word, and hopefully it encourages you. Listen to the to the messages that are archived. There's a YouTube page. There's a... There's a speaker page. Uh, I'll be broadcasting live. Continue to listen to the word and listen to some of the previous messages and open your book. Look at it in different versions. Ask questions. Let's study the word for real. And let's really develop a strong relationship with Christ. Understand that my role is to share the word with you, not to convince you, because the, pro the truth proves itself out. But I'll be accessible to you as well, so that you can ask questions. With that being said, once again, I thank you for your time. I pray that you have a great evening. God bless. Mm -hmm.